Relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't the remotest knowledge of how to live, nor the smallest instinct about when to die. Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. Well, I won't argue about the matter. You always want to argue about things. But that is exactly what things were originally made for. Upon my word, if I thought that, I'd shoot myself. You don't suppose there's much chance of Gwendolyn becoming like her mother in about 150 years, do you, Aunt? All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That's his. Is that clever? It is perfectly phrased. And quite as true as any observation in civilised life should be. I'm sick to death of cleverness. Everybody is so clever nowadays. One can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. The thing has become an absolute public nuisance. I wish to goodness we had a few fools left. We have. I should extremely like to meet them. What do they talk about? The fools. Or about the clever people, of course. What fools? By the way, did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow, the truth isn't quite the sort of thing one tells to a nice, sweet, refined girl. What extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to a woman. The only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her if she is pretty, and to someone else if she is plain. That is nonsense. What about your brother? What about the profligate Ernest? Oh, before the end of the week, I shall have got rid of him. I shall say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Lots of people die of apoplexy quite suddenly, don't they? Yes, but it's hereditary, my dear fellow. It's the sort of thing that runs in families. No, you would much better say a severe chill. You are sure a severe chill isn't hereditary or anything of that kind? No, of course not. Very well. My poor brother Ernest is carried off in Paris quite suddenly by a severe chill. That gets rid of him. But I thought you said that Miss Cardew was a little too much interested in your poor brother Ernest. Won't she feel his loss a good deal? No, that's all right. Cecily is not, I'm glad to say, a silly romantic girl. She has a capital appetite, goes long walks and pays no attention at all to her lessons. I would rather like to see Cecily. I will take very good care you never do. She is excessively pretty and only just 18. Have you told Gwendolyn yet that you have an excessively pretty ward who is only just 18? Oh. One doesn't blurt these things out to people. Gwendolyn and Cecily are perfectly certain to be absolutely great friends. I bet you anything you like. That half an hour after they've met, they'll be calling each other sister. Women only do that when they've called each other a lot of other things first. Now, my dear boy, if we want a good table at Willis's tonight, we really must go and dress. Do you know that's nearly seven? Oh, it always is nearly seven. Well, I'm hungry. I never knew you when you weren't. Miss Fairfax. Gwendolyn, upon my word. Algy, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthy. No, really, Gwendolyn, I don't think I can allow this at all. Algy, you always adopt a strictly immoral attitude towards life. You are not quite old enough to do that. My own darling. Ernest, we may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children say to them. The old-fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I ever had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. But, although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else and marry often, nothing that she can possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. Oh, dear Gwendolyn. The story of your romantic origin is related to me by Mama with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deeper fibres of my nature. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of your character makes you exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Now, your town address at the Albany I have. What is your address in the country? Uh, the, the manor house. Woolton, Hertfordshire. There is a good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something desperate. That, of course, will require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. Oh, my own How long do you remain in town? Till Monday. Good. Algy, you may turn round now. Thanks, I've turned round already. You may also ring the bell. You will allow me to see you to your carriage, my own darling. Certainly. I shall see Miss Fairfax now. Yes. A glass of sherry, Lane. Yes, sir. Tomorrow, Lane, I'm going bunburying. Yes, sir. I shall probably not be back till Monday. You can put up my dress clothes, my smoking jacket, and all the bunbury suits. Yes, sir. I hope tomorrow will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. Lane, you are a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. There's a sensible, intellectual girl. The only girl I ever cared for in my life. <laughs> what on earth are you so amused at? Oh, I'm a little anxious about poor Bunbury, that is all. If you don't take care, your friend Bunbury will get you into a serious scrape someday. I love scrapes. They are the only things that are never serious. No, that is nonsense. Algy, you never talk anything but nonsense. Nobody ever does. Cecily! 
easily. Surely such a utilitarian occupation as the watering of flowers is rather Milton's duty than yours. Especially at a moment when intellectual pleasures await you. Your German grammar is on the table. Pray open it at page 15. We will repeat yesterday's lesson. But I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. He laid particular stress on your German as he was leaving for town yesterday. Indeed, he always lays stress on your German when he is leaving for town. Dear Uncle Jack is so very serious. Sometimes he is so serious, I think he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanour is especially to be commended in one so comparatively young as he is. I know no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he often looks a little bored when we three are together. Cecily, I'm surprised at you. Mr Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. You must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. We might have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I'm sure you certainly would. You know German and geology, and things of that kind influence a man very much. I do not think that even I could produce any effect on a character that, according to his own brother's admission, is irretrievably weak and vacillating. Indeed, I'm not sure that I would desire to reclaim him. I'm not in favour of this modern mania for turning bad people into good people at a moment's notice. As a man sows, so let him reap. You must put away your diary, Cecily. I really don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels that Moody sends us. Do not speak slightingly of three-volume novels, Cecily. I wrote one myself. In earlier days. Did you really, Miss Prism? How wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. They depress me so much. The good ended happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so, but it seems very unfair. And was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript, unfortunately, was abandoned. I use the word in the sense of lost or mislaid. To your work, child. These speculations are profitless. But I see dear Dr. Chasuble coming up through the garden. Oh, Dr. Chasuble, this is indeed a pleasure. And how are we this morning? Miss Prism, you are, I trust, well? Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her so much good to have a short stroll with you in the park, Dr. Chasuble. Cecily, I've not mentioned anything about a headache. No, dear Miss Prism, I know that. But I felt instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that and not about my German lesson when the rector came in. I hope, Cecily, you are not inattentive. Oh, I'm afraid I am. That is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. <laughs> I spoke metaphorically. My metaphor was drawn from bees. <clears throat> Mr. Worthing, I suppose, has not returned from town yet? We do not expect him until Monday afternoon. Ah, yes. He usually likes to spend his Sunday in London. He's not one of those whose sole aim is enjoyment. As by all accounts, that unfortunate young man, his brother, seems to be. <laughs> but I must not disturb Egeria and her pupil any longer. Egeria? My name is Letitia, Doctor. A classical allusion, merely. Drawn from the pagan authors. I shall see you both, no doubt, at Evensong. I think, dear Doctor, I will take a stroll with you. I find I have a headache, after all, and a walk might do it good. With pleasure, Miss Prism, with pleasure. We might go as far as the schools and back. Oh, that would be delightful. Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence. The chapter on the fall of the rupee, you may omit. It is somewhat too sensational. Even the 